So I could tell you a little bit about my job down there. It might be of interest. Uh, I was uh, new at the at the place, uh, and it turns out when I was interviewed from where do I want to go, the uh, I was puzzled between something called rotating machines or a hypersonic tunnel. Mm -hmm. I knew rotating machines. I was supposed to know something about that. And I not, didn't sure I wanted to go there. <laughs> And uh, the guy in the interview, he said, well, you know, you're puzzled. Why don't you just go to the hypersonic tunnel? They don't know what they're doing either. So mm -hmm. I went there and I was the low man on a total pole. But uh, there were a lot of jobs doing all the uh, uh, lab work and testing. Nobody wanted to do that. Uh, they wanted to do actually testing of the wind tunnel. So I got I took care of all the instrumentation for a while. And then uh, because of the, this tunnel, which was, uh, they were trying to develop it, was going at seven times the speed of sound because when you expand air up to Mach 7, that's uh, seven times the speed of sound, it, 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 without some heat, it will turn into liquid air. So they added a big heater, which had, uh, multiple uh, uh, stainless steel tubing and they wrapped electrical heaters around those and they heated it for three hours and then they let it settle so it would smooth out and then they turned on the air. Now, this is a, called a blowdown tunnel. It operates with a huge <clears throat> high pressure tank and on the other end is a gigantic vacuum tank. You open a valve and it goes through the heater and then through the nozzle, which expands it up to the speed you want, and then goes out the other end. So that was a, a, an interesting thing. But one of the problems was that the, this tunnel was a two-dimensional expansion from a, about a quarter of an inch slit up to 11-inch square test section. The quarter-inch square would, excuse me, the quarter-inch slit would uh, would expand due to the heat. Hmm. And so you couldn't, the, the test the Mach number changed all during that time while well, the slit is changing its diameter, yeah. <clears throat> its area. So they had to uh, come up with something new. So another fellow and I uh, designed a new nozzle out of a different material, which didn't expand. And the, the beauty of this is we, the other way, we just put a model in there at one degree and then at one test takes three hours to heat the heater, one hour for it to settle, it takes over four hours to run a test. You can get two tests done, maybe two data points in, in one shift. So we did night shift. That's where I learned to run the tunnel itself. And uh, after we had this uh, non-expanding metal nozzle, then we could move the the model while the flow was on because it's constant Mach number, and uh, got a lot more data. And after a few years, the uh, the uh, uh, la the uh, yeah instrument lab there came up with a, a a measuring device that could measure everything at once. Before we were testing lift, and then we have another test with drag and side force. So but they came up with something that could measure lift, drag, side force, uh, pitching moment, uh, rolling moment, and uh, a yawing moment, all at the same time. Now, when we got to that stage, I didn't realize it, but NASA had been, NACA, that is, at the time, had been uh, involved in the testing of the X-1 and jointly with the Air Force. And that broke the sound barrier. Then later on, they did Mach 3. They were deciding that they were planning on doing a Mach 7 airplane. So they designed one, and uh, I was assigned the job of uh, testing that. I had two buddies, and we, we took turns testing, and we wrote a report for each one, rotated the lead author, from one to the other, and we got that test. Now it, sent, it was sent to four uh, companies. Uh, Bell, the original one that did the X-1, Grumman, uh, North American, and Chance Fought. 
and they sent in their own design. And uh, when they sent it in, they, uh, I was, before they, when they sent it in, we, I was a, a part of the team that evaluated who should win. And I did the aerodynamics that showed that North Americans was the best design. So they made a model and then the three guys, we got together and we tested their model and we found some problems with it and made some separate tests to show them how to make it better. So that was basically uh, the highlight of my thing there was to be assigned to, to make that decision. So uh, uh, before I left there, I got to give a paper at a working um, uh, A group where uh, they had people from all over the country come and and uh, evaluate what we had done. And I, so my first top secret paper ever uh, was on the aerodynamics of the X-15 rocket plane mm. from 100 miles per hour up to Mach 7. And uh, the interesting thing is I it was years before I ever saw the airplane that helped evaluate <laughs> or saw that paper because it was. Were you there when they did testing for this? Like in the, were you, uh, anywhere where you, so you couldn't see the, the tests? The, the, take the place. testing of, of the airplane itself yeah. when it was built was done out in California. Mm -hmm. So I never saw it there. And uh, so I, you got into a, it's a hypersonic wind tunnel. You, you were uh, basically an air, was it called an aeronom aeronomics? Yeah. And that, engineer? and that, time it was called an aeronautical research scientist. Mm -hmm. Later on in my other job, uh, I was just an aeronautical engineer. And you got into this after after World War II or what, what year did you After World this? War II and GI Bill. Okay. So, is this, is cause so I went to yeah. knife school down in Hampton to get the, the so it was a, a University of Virginia uh, degree. Was this a new thing that they were doing then? Oh yes, this yeah. was Mach 7 wind tunnel was totally new. The first version of it that they worked on before I got there was uh, a disaster. <laughs> they tried to expand the, the air twice this way and then this way and it just didn't work. So once they did it, a uh, complete, well, a complete expansion, just two dimensional that worked and then um, Ivan Beck with the other buddy I had there, we did a Mach 10 nozzle. Hmm. So that's about the time that we decided that maybe we had two children by then. And by the way, I forgot to tell you that Nancy, after the first year or so, was a little lonely, you know, cleaning house at home, <laughs> doing nothing. She decided that maybe she needed a job. So she got a job at, at NACA and she worked in the seven foot ten ten by seven foot tunnel oh wow as okay. as a a math tech uh for the only lady engineer in the whole place at the time you were the f what was that like you're the only woman engineer uh, no no, no. The, the, she worked, I worked for, for the engineer. woman engineer wow. yes ah, okay. and um i worked on a great big machine uh computer where you punch, you know, the input. These were, yes. Uh, yeah. These were, I would get the um, statistics from the wind tunnel and put it into um, a program of uh, equations. And then, um, and these were testing stability of airplanes. And it, as Herb told you, the different points were um, the yaw and uh, the angle of attack and things of that sort to get this long equation solved. It was very interesting. After <coughs> I had uh, the equation solved, then I would take the different points and put them on a chart and draw the curve. And that curve would go into a report that the um, female engineer was writing, and then it would be published. 
and all of those. And it was just uh, the thing we did by hand. There was no printing or anything like that. Mm -hmm. It was the actual equation you worked on. And uh, so it was very primitive. Yeah, but, now, uh, nowadays it computers handle all that. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's right. Yeah, at the top, at top of the page, they'd have, you know, angle of attack, it's so-and-so, and times uh, this, minus so and four, that all across the page, maybe 10, 12, 15 different steps. You had to do each one and change the angle of attack and do the calculation now, again. what is angle of attack? Well, that's just uh, uh, from a zero if you're getting a zero. lift. If the airplane's going up like yeah. this, and it's the attack, the, the angle, yeah, oh, the, the angle the, the between the horizontal, the yeah. Okay, yeah, like when you said any angle of attack, I'm thinking like like fighter jets. Like, yeah, like, no, like, no, that's just the term they use. Yeah. For so, the, uh, so, so angle attack is basically the the wind coming up and, and giving it lift, basically. Yeah. Okay. And, and it's interesting that uh, in supersonic flow, which I was involved in, it was totally different from subsonic flow. You know, the airplanes today, even they're subsonic, they have a curved wing, and the air goes faster over the top than the bottom, and it, it turns out it develops a low pressure there, and that gives a vacuum that lifts the wing up. When you go through a Mach 1, uh, it turns around the other way. The lift is like a ramming effect on the bottom. Mm. So everything, so you don't, now, you have to have wings that look a lot that to land, so you have to design it, but you know that when you're in supersonic flow, the lift is from a different source. You have to design for that as well. It's kind of like, uh, I've heard F1 cars is really like the aerodynamic looking cars. Uh, they're not NASCARs, but like yeah. they, they're so fast and, and the downforce is so much that they could literally drive on the top of a tunnel yeah. at full speed and stay on the top. Yeah. It's kind of probably like uh, weird things when you're going super fast or yeah, right. physics are different. Um, what is, what was I going to ask? It was, see what I'm trying to ask two questions at once. Okay. One goes out the window. Um, yes. It was, yeah, uh, now, my, now my, my brain's running a blank. Um, but yeah, it's it's kind of something like that where it's, it's just the, the weird nature of physics and, yeah. It is, right. It's uh, interesting because uh, in order to get my degree, I had to uh, do a thesis. And my boss uh, gave me a top secret paper about a German who had developed a rocket plane mm. that was going to fly from Germany and glide to New York and bomb it. Now, for some reason, Hitler decided to go with these rockets that uh, hit London and uh, he dropped this other, but this guy had developed this rocket plane. Wow. And uh, there, I was given that, and I'm told to go investigate that. Well, one of the main things was this business about the lift from the bottom. So I took a, a cylindrical fuselage with a ogive uh, shaped nose, and I cut the bottom off, and I compared of a flat bottom, I call it a D-shaped body compared to a round body. And I showed that the uh, the lift to drag ratio uh, was much better if you have it flat bottom. Now, if you've ever seen the uh, shuttle, it has a flat bottom because it goes supersonic, but then it has to land and uh, it, it lands with wings that are developed for landing. but. It's also flat because uh, they wanted to get a lot of cargo in it. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless. Uh, Why is it that when you're going supersonic, that flat bottoms, it, I mean, it's normally it's, isn't it round bottoms that, that give you lift or? Well, mostly you're not you're usually not getting a, a lot of lift from a, you just get all the lifts from the wings. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but I was uh, just, we, we always tested a model with the fuselage by itself. Then we put the wings on and we tested that. Then we put the tail on and we tested that, that configuration. And uh, you, you build up the configuration step by step and you could do the, the body and the wing and then the body and the tail, everything separate and then put it all together. We did test data on all of those and we could see what's doing what to what there. 
can you tell us more about the the top secret um, paper about <laughs> about the the German who had developed this rocket that was going to it was like a manned rocket that would fly to New York and bomb it, basically? No, it was, it was no manned rocket to it. Just something that glided. Uh, oh, okay. and, that, and it was all, the main th thing about it is it had this flat bottom and it had a, wings that were uh, going to make it go at very hypersonic speeds. Mm. And they had to know about the shock waves on it. Everything that goes supersonic has a shock wave from it. Mm -hmm. Even at Mach 1, there's shock waves. But the problem at Mach 1 is that they sit on the wing. They're straight up and down. They're not bent back. And that uh, uh, gives a, a big problem for controls. And this was all came from the fact that in World War II, our airplanes, when either they were getting away from the enemy, would go into a dive or... If the enemy did that, they were going down after them. And going down, they they went at really high speeds, and the temperature, the air, the speed of sound, by the way, was dependent only on temperature. The temperature was changing in such a way that they were getting into a, a Mach 1 type conditions. And, the, and these standing shock waves that you learned later were it's disrupting the controls. Mm. So uh, that's why they developed the X1 to try and learn how can we get through the sound barrier. They thought that could be a big problem. Now, what exactly happens that disrupts the, the controls? Do you... Well, uh, let's just at first talk about subsonic. There, mm -hmm. In subsonic flow, there are no shock waves. You know, the pressure is a pretty constant the density is certainly pretty constant, but when you go faster and faster, the effects of density change, and you end up with a, <clears throat> a, a body that's moving faster than the speed of sound, and the speed of sound is sending out waves, but the, the body is going faster, than, and these waves coalesce into a, uh, an increased density. Uh, mm. Just a line... It could be, you know, if it's, you think of a nose, it'd be round all the way. But there'd be a shock wave coming back like this. It bends back, starts off normal, and then gradually, as you go higher and higher speeds, it, they come back almost back onto the fuselage. Mm. And uh, you can that's where they get these sonic booms. In those days, people would hear airplanes that were breaking the sound barrier. So like the, the density of the air would kind of come back to the front of the, the fuselage, you're saying? Yeah. It would. Interesting. <clears throat> the, Hope I'm getting the, that right. The sound wave is going to go a specific speeds, 700 and like 776 something miles per hour. That's the speed of sound. So when a body is moving, it's giving off this sound wave all in all directions. <clears throat> But the vehicle is going faster than that, and it goes through it and rams right through it, and it, run, it runs into the sound waves, and uh, there they form a shock wave in the front. It's hard to describe that without oh, math so, mathematics. Yeah. So the the sh <laughs> okay. So the sound waves are what is that? What's pushing the the particle or the air forward in front of the well, fuselage? Well, the, the airplane is going faster than the sound waves. Okay. So they're going this way, but the airplane is going faster. And so that creates So they can't catch up. So, and, that, so when you see like these, like, 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 a like say, let's say for the moment, here's the body and there's a sound wave starts off. A little later, and that body is going and the sound wave is now out here. It's going spherically. It's in, there's nothing directing the sound wave and it's getting bigger and bigger. But the, the body itself is going faster than that, and it gets ahead of it. And so you, you, you get a conical effect back of, of it. You can imagine this, it's, the sound wave starts small here, gets bigger, 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 bigger. As the vehicle keeps going, the sound wave is still and growing. And that's that cone. Yeah, that so it makes see this conical we... shape. Oh, I've always wondered that. That's a... That's a crude. I didn't expect to learn that. Crude right description of what it is. <laughs> glad, glad we kept asking about this. Oh, it, now, I think the only other question that could be wrong, it, there might be more questions about this, but like, 
uh, the other the other thing is like it's is it was that rocket that that German developed any yeah. was it any was it related at all to like wasn't it was, I think it was the V one rocket that no that's the point they they had the V one rockets uh, as a as a weapon mm -hmm. and they gave up their effort on this other one and and for those who don't know what the they, V one rocket is well it's, it's there, there's the it's, it's unmanned rocket or here's something. the uh, the situation when the, uh, the the Germans defeated the French and the English British in Europe, they were they got all the way to the coast. I think it took them ten days to go through them, get to the coast, and then uh, a lot of the British got away at a place called Dunkirk because the little ships yeah. were sent over to, to save them. So now Britain's alone. And in no time at all, they defeated the French and captured uh, Paris. Uh, so they had this uh, problem of uh, how are they, how are they going to defeat the British? The British had some advantages that 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 saved them, but I don't want to go into that. I just want to mention that the Germans had a good technique. They were going over and bombing the British airfields. And that was making it very hard because all those airfields were along the, the coast of, of uh, England. And accidentally, one of the German bombers or groups went over and bombed London by accident instead of an airfield. And Hitler got upset uh, with that because uh, he then bombed London and the British went and bombed Berlin. So they start now fighting it for that, and that they ignored the airfields, <laughs> which gave the British a big break. I think I heard about it. Yeah, they, yeah. they blew the whole thing right there, and that, that thing went on for a, a, a whole summer into the fall. And uh, my, my grandfather over there was uh, uh, got a cold getting up for the... Uh, Air raid. Air raid shelters, and uh, he he died, and we got a letter at at our home from my father's sister that uh, he had he had passed on. So that was a sad thing, uh, indirectly killed by the Germans. Now, did he uh, did he fly over, or was it was it from a bombing that he died? Uh, he, uh, no, uh, he. At nighttime, he had to. He's eighty-two years old. He had to get up and go to a, a bomb shelter. I don't know if it was in his backyard or where it was, but he caught a cold, oh, okay. and because of that cold, he died from whatever uh, uh, effects it gave it. So they were they were bombing the during. Was it during Dunkirk that they were bombing the uh, airfields? No, this is. Uh, uh, yeah, it was. At, after Dunkirk, they were they started bombing uh, the airfields in mm -hmm. England. The British the British had two really good planes, as good as uh, fighter planes, as good as the Messerschmitt that the Germans had, but the the bombers just kept coming over and over. And uh, the British had radar, believe it or not, they figured out radar, and they had people on the coast. And they could record, or they could send messages back to the people that were in charge, and they could tell ahead of time that the that with the radar where, how many planes and where they're coming going to. They can trace, it. so they could uh, send the right amount of airplanes to the right place when mm -hmm. the Germans came over. That was a big advantage. For, yeah. And besides that, the the German fighters had to cross the, the channel, do their fighting, and then they had to go back home. So they ran out of gas faster than the, the British planes who didn't have to worry about that. So there was two advantages, that, that gas problem and the fact that the, the British could allocate the right number of airplanes and men to the, to the right place every time the Germans came over. Just some history. No, I, I actually That's the remember battle of, about that. The battle of uh, Britain. We listened to the radio every night <laughs> at our house. Uh, they, they they would tell you how many 
German planes were shot down every day, 59 today, 80. They were, it's just unbelievable. Wow. We so, didn't know whether they were fake numbers or not, but the British were definitely winning. Yeah. And you said that your grandfather was in England? Yes. Yeah, see, my, fa my father was born in a little town of Goldborn in Lancashire, England. Wow. In World War I, he, uh, he came from a line of miners. But he was a, a mechanic, he was a machinist. And during that war, all, all the big battleships and so forth were built in Scotland. Did you know that in Scotland, where my mother lives, a little town of Clyde Bank, they built the, the uh, Queen Mary, the Queen Elizabeth I and II. They built all of the battleships up there. So my dad was recruited to go work up there and uh, in a shipyard. And uh, he was a, a plater's helper, <laughs> but he rented an apartment at um, one of my uncles, and that's where he met my mother. So you're uh, of English descent. I'm of English descent, wow. but with a, a, a Scottish mother. Scottish. And my two brothers were born over there. After the war, they didn't need all this help at the shipyard, so he was out of a job, so he decided to come to the U.S. I was born here. I'm the only one in the family that was born here. You don't have an accent. <laughs> well, my mother had an accent, yeah. but not my father, really. So, 